not far from Aldin, but also not here. We just need a few seconds for, uh, for the connection to become active. Yeah, and I think we're we're good to go. Yeah, my screen. Yeah, Alia, yeah. you will start with um, so your work with Cine. Okay, can I start now? You are all good, all okay. set. Yeah. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Alia, and I'm here to present you my internship. Um, project, which is the survey of noise hotspots in the Mediterranean Sea. It's a work that I did with Cine, um, along with my supervisor, Alessio Maliu. And so cetaceans are aquatic animals belonging to the order cetacea, which includes dolphins, whales, and porpoises. These animals rely on sound as their primary sense um, in order to carry out many different activities, such as echolocation, um, it's useful for them to detect their environment and also to distinguish uh, identical objects. For navigation, to, um, they use sounds for orientation and also navigation because they are migratory animals. And also for communication, for example, between mother and calf, <clears throat> for group cohesion, and also to distinguish um, individuals. And so there are many human activities that can cause um, that can cause problems to cetaceans. Um, the tools that are used, for example, air guns, sonars, pile drivers, they can impact cetaceans in terms of uh, physical and also they can impact them behaviorally. And so we are interested in two types of noise, which are impulsive noise, um, it's usually a loud noise, um, short duration, such as pile driving and also continuous noise that is more um, long term, but um, they can also impact cetaceans such as um, sonars. And so why this work? And so there are a lot of studies in different parts of the world regarding um, noise pollution and indeed they impact cetaceans. However, uh, little to no known data um, regarding where and when these activities happen, which make it hard for management measures and also prevention. The first study about the distribution of noise pollution was done in 2016 by a group of scientists coordinated by um, CINE under the initiative of ACOBAMPS which is the agreements on the conservation of cetaceans in the Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea, and also contiguous Atlantic uh, area. And so this work is to provide um, information and it will later then be used for um, conservation measures that are developed by ACOBOMS and also is to feed CINES platform And the objective of this internship is to search and gather data on activities that can create underwater pollution. The geographical scope is in the Mediterranean Sea in the time period between 2016 and 2020. The data collected were differentiated into three main categories that were decided by CINE, which are port works, seismic surveys, offshore and coastal works. And the final output will be the maps of the different distribution, which I did have a say in this. I decided what kind of maps that will be put, um, Excel files, and also geo package file. And moving on to, and so with this in mind, there is a question that I would like to test, um, that I would like to ask, which is, is the distribution of noise producing human activities distributed evenly in the Mediterranean Sea. And the hypothesis that I would like to test is the distribution of noise pollution in the Mediterranean Sea is not evenly distributed. So to the methods, first, 
um, I did inventory search um, through the through the through internet. It can be through official websites, for example, official websites of the ports where they have annual reports, government websites, um, different articles. And in addition to that, I also contacted different stakeholders in the Mediterranean countries in order to get more additional data. And so once I collected the different data, I compiled it in Microsoft Excel, which, um, which then I will analyze it in QGIS and R in order to produce the different maps of the distribution. And so as we can see here, um, this is the results of my work. Um, this is the port works distribution. Um, as we can see, um, there were a list of harbors um, given to me um, by the previous work done by Sine. However, it was just a list of harbors. There weren't um, what kind of activities that it was done before. And so what I did is taking the list of harbors and um, making inventories on what kind of activities that they did. And the activities were divided into four categories, which are dredging, pile driving, the use of explosives, and also drilling. And so this is the year by year map. And as you can see in 2016 to 2018, they have approximately um, the same amount of works, whereas in 2019 to 2020, um, 2019, they have, it had more work compared to um, the other years. And so looking at the overall map here, and so in total, I found um, 80 ports in which different works were carried out. Um, there were different sizes of dots here. It represents, and so the smallest dot, it represents um, the port only had one work. For example, um, this port only had one work in 2016, for example. And the medium one, it means that the port had two works done between the time period. And the biggest one, it means that the port had three works. And also I highlighted the countries in gray over here. It means that there were no, um, no works found. You can see here in Libya, in Syria, in Montenegro, and also in Monaco, but it cannot be seen. And the highest number can be found in 2019 with 53 um, works, and the lowest were in 2016 and 2017. And talking about um, works per country, as we can see in the graph, Italy had the most amount of work with 40, followed by Spain, 19, and France, 18. Um, a study by Mario et al. in 2016 found that Italy had the most um, number of harbors, um, followed by these countries, and therefore it is very um, likely for them to have more works in comparison to other countries. And so there were some challenges um, during the data collection, one of them being language, um, especially for the countries who, who does not use um, Latin alphabets. It caused data, some data to be left unexplored. And also I found different quality of data. For example, in bigger ports, I can found like a much more detailed data, um, whereas others, mm, I can't, find like um, the, uh, the same information. And moving on to the seismic surveys. And the seismic surveys here are mostly for oil and gas exploration, except for France, which are used for studies. And the exploration permits for seismic surveys can last for several years. However, it does not mean that the actual survey was done every year. However, since I do not have the information regarding um, the exact time. I use the start and end date of the permits. And this is the year by year uh, seismic explorations. And this is the overall part. Um, the seismic surveys were distributed in 20 countries. However, there were um, some seismic surveys that were not mapped because I could not find the exact location. And 
The seismic surveys are more located in the eastern part of the Med Sea as well as in the Adriatic and Ionian Sea over here. Um, also, Mind you, et al. in 2016 also found that most licensing blocks were in the eastern and in the southern part of the Mediterranean Sea. Little to no data, as um, previously was stated here, little to no data were found regarding um, seismic surveys done in the west part of the Med Sea. And this may be caused by different, um, different regulations that each country have. For example, in France, it is not allowed um, starting this year, it is not allowed for seismic surveys um, to be, um, it is not allowed for, it is not allowed anymore, the exploration permit. Um, and also, um, there are some countries um, that um, intersected with other sea that may have done the seismic surveys, but it's not in the Mediterranean Sea. For example, Morocco recently um, conducted seismic surveys. However, it's in the Atlantic area um, of the ocean and not in the Mediterranean. And so computing the total seismic area, as we can see, 2018 had the most um, surface area, uh, which is almost 500,000 kilometers square. And this contributes to 19.4% of the Mediterranean surface. And the lowest was found in 2019, which contributed to 9.6% of the Mediterranean surface. And the reason why 2019 was the lowest was probably because, um, as I mentioned before, there were some data that were not um, in the map due to insufficient um, um, data on the location. And out of six data, five of them were in 2019 and 2020. And it may be the reason why it is lower than the other years. And moving on to offshore and coastal works. Um, there were seven works distributed in seven different countries. Um, how, however, the data for coastal and offshore works were not, um, were not complete as in a, there were insufficient data in which the location, for example, in this map, it does not reprint the actual data because there were half um, of the works missing. Um, the works included drillings for oil and gas, and also there is a development of wind farm in the southern of Italy. There is land extension in Monaco and also a bridge construction in Turkey. And so as we can see here, this is the overall distribution of the noise producing human activities carried out in the Mediterranean Sea. Now I realize that this work is incomplete because there were some data that are missing in some countries and also in some works. However, we can see the overall distribution of the anthropogenic noise and it can be used as the first step to um, create management also, so prevention um, to, um, to lessen the impacts on cetaceans. And in order for this data to be complete, um, more data are needed, such as the temporal and also the special scale in which um, some activities were done. Uh, and so for ports, we can see it's more concentrated in the Northern part and for seismic surveys in the eastern part, and also some missing. And to conclude, going back again to one by one, for ports, there were 80 ports found um, in which the highest number of works can be found in 2019 and 2020, with Italy, Spain, and France as the biggest contributors. And for seismic surveys, the highest surface area was found in 2018 um, with almost 500,000 kilometers squares that corresponded to 19.4% of the Mediterranean surface. Um, and the seismic surveys were located mostly in the southern and eastern basin. For off coastal and offshore wind, for coastal and offshore works, um, it is distributed throughout 10 countries, 
in which drillings, offshore wind farm, land extension, and bridge constructions um, were uh, took place. And in order to have a more detailed data, then the spatial and temporal occurrence uh, are needed to complete the to complete the study and to better complete the distribution uh, of noise producing activities in the med in the Med Sea. And finally, we have the hypothesis that the distribution of noise pollution in the Mediterranean Sea is not evenly distributed. And before closing, I will just say. Uh, acknowledgement to Aquabums as the funding agency, Alessio as my supervisor, Samuel who always helped me in data analysis, and also from Maris team, the professors and my and the Maris friends. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Questions? Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so congratulations for your presentation, also for giving it in uh, the allotted time. So good. Um, I'm always, uh, I like to first off and open the floor maybe to uh, Aldine or, or Juliette. Aldine, do you want to start? Yeah. So thank you, uh, Alia, for this uh, presentation. So. I have uh, two main questions. So uh, the first one is that, um, do, do you have access to, uh, so do you know the impact? So scientifically, maybe we have some literature about mm -hmm. which kind of impact um, we can have on, on the cetacea regarding the noise pollution. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have access to, uh, to this data, can you compare uh, those data um, with your map? And uh, did you try to do that? If you have uh, the impact of noise pollution on cetacea at different sites in Mediterranean, and, and can you compare that with the work you, you currently did? Um, for the impact themselves, um, yes, um, I know from, from different studies. However, I did not do a comparison. However, there is a study um, in, the, in the Mediterranean that compared um, that did um, like, um, I'm sorry, uh, strandings of, of um, this whale that in, in my picture, the Cuvier's big whale. And so they have a map um, of which in the Mediterranean Sea are these whales stranded. And also they compare it with um, and the, the noise pollution. And so for my study itself, I just did a, uh, review in which part is which, but I can definitely um, like for further further studies, I can definitely do do it uh, with um, uh, you know, with different types of impacts. So and, and just second question. So you propose something to improve your current work. It's to collect more data regarding uh, regarding the, the, the Mediterranean work in, in the arbor that has been done. But can you imagine uh, rather so it's collecting data but at smaller scale, meaning that do you think that this kind of work now you try to target the entire Mediterranean Sea? Mm -hmm. And do you think it's not better to start by um, by framing different uh, space, different area in Mediterranean, and dig into specifically this different area for you to have much more, uh, I mean, deeper access to, to to this data. And then after, when you did the survey on on this different uh, area, combine them together. Yes, for sure. Um, but I think that. Um depends on what kind of studies that you want to that you want to do in my case it's for aquabums and aquabums is um, a multinational agreement and they cover the Mad sea the black sea and also the atlantic part and so if we do it um, and so i have to do it in the whole mediterranean sea in order to get a clear picture Yes. of how the work is, uh, yeah, for- Yes, but for what I mean is that, of course you will do the entire Mediterranean mm -hmm. Sea, but doing a uh, smaller area by smaller area, because here you want to, you are targeting a scale that I even don't know which kind of threshold you uh, integrate in your work regarding 
the the noise pollution in or the work in different arbor. Mm. So, and I think this is a little bit missing for me in the introduction. How do you define that this is currently noise pollution or can be a potential noise pollution or not for Cetace? So I, di I divided the, for port works, I divided it into four categories, um, dredging, pile driving, the use of explosive and also drillings. And from that categories, I search one by one from the ports that CNA has, that CNA has listed. And so I search one by one if this port has dredging or not, if this port has pile driving or not. Um, and so, yeah, I search one by one before actually having this um, big distribution that you see in the map. So, Juliette, do you want to continue? Uh, yes, so um, thank you, Alia, for your presentation. It was really well designed, I think. And I had the same uh, remarks as Aldin. Uh, maybe in your introduction, I wanted to know more about the relation between noise pollution and these effects on cetaceans. So Aldin already spoke about that, but I wanted a uh, little bit to know more about uh, the, um, the goal of your project. So I don't know much about ACOBAM, but uh, I Maybe it's a legal conservation tool, I suppose. So it's part of a, a big uh, framework. So do you know if they, they plan to, uh, to publish reports or um, to, to start a kind of development of stru strategy uh, for maybe a bigger uh, European framework? Uh, what did, did they plan with this study after that? Um, Yes, the ACOBAM did um, um, a lot of projects and also um, they did research. The one that did recently was in 2016. Um, they gathered data from 2005 to 2015. And so my studies, it's from 2016 to 2020. And so it's sort of like an updated um, version um, for it. And yeah. Okay, so, uh, so they're gonna produce this report, but do you know what are the next steps after that? Are they gonna implement some laws or? So um, what are I they know. gonna do with that after your report, for, for example? Mm. I know for sure that they are going to, like from this data, um, probably maybe they're going to add more and like they're going to publish um, the, the research, but after that, like um, I don't know what kind of um, what kind of measures that they will take from here. Although they do have um, a lot of um, how do you say a lot of um, projects regarding uh, noise pollution. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um... My questions could be also on the on the database so you're using. Uh, how much do you think we can rely on this database? What are the limitations of the, of the database itself? What do you think? Um, the, I mean, even from the, the data I've collected? Yeah. And so the limitation is that um, it's because I still, there are some data missing as in like the, the time, for example, in seismic surveys, like I couldn't find the, when is the actual survey was done. And also a lot of data are missing from um, a lot of countries and missing from ports. Um, for example, the, um, there were about 200 listed ports However, I only found 80 ports in total in which they have this um, kind of data. And so my database can provide um, the overall um, overview for anthropogenic noise. However, I, th I still think that more research needs to be done in order for it to be called um, complete. 
Okay, so uh, do you have a, an idea of the significance of the data you have? What's the, what's the proportion you think about the works that you have reported here compared to all of those that maybe uh, pass below the radar? I would say less than 50%, I would say, 50% tops. Okay, and what allows you to, to say that? You have also some reports or observations? Um, no, it was um, mostly, no, because I don't have a comparison. However, like from previous data made by Cine, for example, they listed 286 harbors and I only found 80 harbors. So it means that I am missing a lot of, um, a lot of ports. And I am sure that they did work between the 2016 to 2020. It's just that because some data are more available to the others and some not. And so that's why like, that's where my limitation is. Yes, okay. And so now I may be coming back to previous questions, but what are the implications of, of your work? What do you think? So not what ACOBAMS will do, but what would you do now with your data? No, I think I would, I would really like to um, search more, especially like to find, um, to fill the missing gaps, for example, regarding the locations um, that I missed before, like um, because some of the um, works that I have mentioned in in um, the database did not make it to the map, and so I would like to like fill in the gaps for for these works in order for it to be um, more more reliable. Okay, so it's improving your own data, but then with this data, what can you do? Because the idea, I guess, is not just to have uh, maps, but uh, yeah. what about uh, comparisons? Maybe what Aldin said at the beginning, how could we compare this with other types of data? And also uh, maybe how can we use that for mitigation, regulation, policies? And so I think like what, what's interesting about this is that, um, the, the first study about the overall distribution was done in 2016. And even then the work was, is not the same, uh, quite the same as mine, it's similar, but it's not the same. For example, the port works, the, before it was only listed the port works, but, uh, sorry, it was only listed the, the number of ports, but there were not um, works like what kind of works in the port. And so um, I think this is, um, this is good because it is like, it can be used for different things because there aren't a lot of studies yet that um, did the distribution of um, this noise pollution. Okay, and uh, so now talking about the countries and, and the types of, of noise pollution, uh, we are, but already talked about that. I'm a bit more curious about what you think are the most invasive type of noise with the different types of works you, you talked about here. I mean, in terms of uh, length, uh, frequency, or uh, of course, intensity. Mm. Um, of course, each noise has like different, uh, um, each noise, like the continuous and impulsive noise have um, effects on cetaceans, but I would say the ones that impact most is um, the low frequency noise, which is produced by the seismic surveys, because there are lots of cases um, of whale stranding caused by um, this um, by these sonars, because the the work is because unlike dredging, for example, where the work is done for um, a short period of time like seismic surveys are more um, in a long time frame. Okay. Um, do you want to add anything, Juliette or Altin? No? Okay, thank you, Alia. I think we're good to go. Um, I don't see uh, questions directly from, from your supervisor, but uh, Florina and Julia are saying congratulations, Alia. Thank you. Already. Um, so we can continue with uh, Ludovic. Yes. You want to share your screen?
OK, Ludovic, we sit. Good luck. You've got 15 minutes. 15, sorry. Hello, everyone. So today I'm going to present you the result of biological state assessment of coral reefs on the Arctic expedition. So first of all, I want to talk about the importance of coral reefs and why we have to study them. First, they are pretty important to them by being homes to one third of marine biodiversity. They play also a huge role in a lot of uh, ecosystemic services, such as preventing shoreline flooding and erosion. They are also pretty important in terms of socioeconomic activities. 500 million people directly depend on them for their survival, and they are of $30 billion per year. However, coral reefs are more threatened than ever before. And due to climate change and especially ocean warming and acidification, it's been estimated that at the end of the century, most of the coral reef will disappear. Also, we need to understand what is a coral. So as you can see on the left picture, coral are an animal from the Tindarian film. And their specificity rely on the fact that they are home to a microalgae. Like the microalgae is from the Zogzata group, and it's called the symbiont. And on the cartoon, you can see the symbiont inside the host cell. We can divide the coral in two different groups, depending on how they cope with their zooxanthellae. There is the specialist group that can cope with an, one species only, and any time and any places. And there is a generalist that can cope with several species of zooxanthellae at different times or different places. Also, we have to understand the mutualistic relationship between the host and the symbiont, which is a coral symbiosis, and that we can sum up with an exchange between the symbiont and the host. For the part of the symbiont, part of the organic compound created through photosynthesis, as well as oxygen will be given to the host. And on the counterpart, the host will give part of the nitrogen and phosphate waste through its metabolism, and also a protected environment against predation, for instance, to the symbiont. However, such environmental stress can threaten this relationship, such as an increase in seawater temperature that can lead to a symbiotic break will result the expulsion of the ion from the host cell to the seawater, leading to the bleaching state. So as you can see in the picture, the cores will appear white because that's the color of the skeleton and the natural color coming was coming from a symbiont. On the short to middle term, the core will enter a starvation state, which means that it cannot acquire the food that was given previously by the symbiont. If the state lasts too long, it will eventually cause the death of the reef. This is text that the the Taro Pacific Expedition has been launched in 2016 and in 2018. They have sampled 32 different islands all along the Pacific, and they have chosen this particular place because first of the reef's diversity. Most of the coral reefs are present, but also with the environmental variation between all the islands. For instance, some islands were totally isolated, other and also in terms of water temperature or other uh, water parameters such as the temperature. So, bigger and diverse uh, sample, the Tara Pacific Consortium has designed a pan ecosystemic approach with the main goal being assessing the coral health and the resilience of the Pacific. They've decided to do that to three different axes. The first one being the environmental data all around the coral reef. After the coral host himself, both into the genomic, transcriptomic, and phenotypic biomarkers part, and also through the microbiome that uh, live inside the coral host. My laboratory was in charge of the phenotypical biomarker approach, but also they were working in collaboration with the environmental team to correlate the result. So during my mushroom project, I has been working with biomass biomarkers to assess the health of coral. The first one being the animal biomass for meaning one of protein exotic per centimeter square. And that refer to the tissue thickness. 
after we have the symbionts biomass in two units, million of symbionts per surface, centimeter square. This is mainly used in ecological uh, study of coral reef, but we need to be able to compare our results with their results in literature review. However, because we are more into the biochemistry and physiological part of the study, we also need to have an idea about the density of symbiont in volume of tissue, so the tissue thickness in milligram of protein. Of course, I could not do all the islands of the Terra Pacific expedition, so I have been focused on Clipperton, uh, Morian, French Polynesia, and Chesterfield. This is a quick review of the three islands. As you can see, they have different morphology. Also, Moria is the only inhabited island, the two other are isolated. And also, the water temperature is changing, like Moria and Clipperton being warm temperature islands, and Chesterfield more temperate one. Finally, I have to add that Mora has been living several bleaching episodes in its environmental history. For the wool expedition, the Tara Pacific has been focuses on two different species because they were present in almost every reefs. First one being Poetes lobata, with a morphology massive, columnar and presenting coral coralite, and being a symbiont specialist. Bacillopuram andrinae is the second one and is a branching coral and a symbiont generalist. Okay, so for my internship question, I asked myself, can we identify biological states using biomass biomarkers in the three French islands? To do so, we have this biomarker approach with the experimental design where a fragment of the sam coral sample were put in contact with a buffer with the buffer, we can isolate the zooxanthellae, the animal extract, and the coral skeleton. And with those three elements, we can, with the animal extract, thanks to Bradford assay, assess the concentration of protein. With the coral skeleton, we can assess the tissue coverage using an aluminum measurement. And finally, for the zooxanthellae, we can have the symbiont density with a cell counting device and a microscope. By doing so, we obtained the biomarkers data that I've been uh, analyzed using means comparison or PC analysis. And we obtained the biomass markers that we can correlate to environmental condition, cellular stress biomarker, genetic data, and the other results for the other island. However, in this presentation, I'm just going to do biomass marker and environmental condition. Okay. So the first set of results I'm going to present to you will be the biological state depending on the species independently from the island. I decided to use a PCA to represent the result and I'm going to quickly explain what is a PCA to you. You see a cloud of dots. Every dot stands for one colony and the position of the dot is the sum of all the correlation of the colony with the tree vector. By the way, the vector, as you can see, the first one is the animal biomass, and the two others are the symbionts biomass. Finally, in red, we have Poritas lobata, and in blue, we have Pocillopora mandrina. So by looking at the analysis, we can see that the most saturating vector was the Zox per centimeter square, and there is a strong separation of the two species on the PCA, which we can conclude that there is two biological states. Independently from the island, for it is a small thick coral with a high zooxanthellae density, and Pocillopoamon is a thin coral with fewer zooxanthellae. That's something that we were expecting because this is two different species that we are dealing with, and that can come two species life trait. For it is a small stroke growth and low recruitment rate coral, which means it will allocate more energy into creating tissue reserve and therefore more biomass. And Pocillopora mandrina is a fast growth coral and high recruitment rate. It will put more energy into reproduction and growing. Therefore, there is no much left for the biomass. Okay, so we have identified two biological states, and now we are going to see how those biological states change depending on the island. So you have the first graph being the animal biomass, and the two others being the symbiont biomass in the two way to express them. First, we will have on the x-axis Moria, Chesterfield, and Clipperton. Finally, you see letters. This is the significant letter 
of the results of our statistical analysis. And if the letters are the same, there is no significant difference. So for Poritas Lobata, as you can see, the trend is that there is no Tulot variation between the islands. Therefore, we have an homogeneous state among the three islands. That's something that was already noticed before. Like Poritas Lobata show little variation of tissue biomass with environmental variation. And also, I remind you that Poritas Lobata is a symbiont specialist with one uh, thermotolerance, Zoxantelae, which means that there is uh, an overall stability for it. If we look this time to Pocilopora Manduna, we see that that's another story. Like there is much more variation between the island for the biomass biomarkers. So this variation can be explained to the host diversity as well as symbiont diversity. Pocilopora Manduna being a symbiont specialist, generally, sorry, it can cope with different species of Zoxantelae that come with different type of characteristics. Okay, now if we take the results that we previously had and put them on the PCA, we can identify for Procilopora Manduna some structuration of data for the island. First one will be structured by the animal biomass vector with Chesorfield having the highest animal biomass. We have Clipperton that's more structurating around the symbiotic uh, biomass vector and presenting the highest symbiotic biomass. And finally, we have Moria, which show the lowest biomass for Procilopora Mandrina for both biomass uh, biomarkers. Therefore, there is a, it seems that there is a structuration around the environment and an influence. Finally, for Poritas Lobata this time, there is no such structuration of the island. It's more mixed on the PC analysis. And in fact, uh, that's something that we have noticed before. I remind you on the first result, like the homogeneous state. And this is also the homogeneous state between the different islands. So we have no structuration around the environment for Poritas Lobata. To understand finally uh, why Pocilopora Mandrina have such variation with the environment, we can look at the environmental parameters. So you can see the PCA with the different uh, environmental parameters that we have chosen. And the most defining one seems to be the particulate organic carbon, BOC, with Moria being the lowest in terms of concentration, Chesterfield the intermediate, and Clipperton the highest. So just to remind you quickly, particulate organic carbon are a size of organic carbon, which go through the zooplankton, phytoplankton, and bacteria. And below, you can see the actual value that they have found at the time of the expedition. OK. But what are the influence of POC, and where does it come from? It can come from guado deposits, which are like seabird faces on, that were present on Chesterfield and Clipperton and then significantly increase the POC concentration in the surrounding water. For the effect, particulate organic carbon will increase coral heterotrophy. Previously, I explained to you that most of the coral food come from autotrophic activity from the symbiont. However, we have to also to take into consideration the predation that the coral can do and the additional uh, food uptake. The effects are an increased symbiont cell division, Therefore, there is more symbiotic biomass, but also an increase of tissue reserves, which mean more animal biomass. So thanks to the two biomass biomarkers, we were able to identify for Poritas lobata one biological state with no influence of the environment. And this stability can be explained through the fact that it is a symbiont specialist. For uh, Pocilopora mandrina this time, we're able to identify three biological states. The first one being a thin tissue with low symbiont density on Moria. The second one being a thick tissue with intermediate symbiont density on Chesterfield. And on average, tissue thickness and high symbiont density on Clipperton. Therefore, we were able to conclude that there is an influence on the environment. And that by being a symbiont generalist, and the fact that you can cope with different species of Zoxantelae, there is more variation for Pocilopora Mandrina. Also, Chesterfield and Clipperton possess rich POC water due to their guano deposit, and they can have a significant impact on the heterotrophy and the increase of biomass. Finally, 
I want to remind you that the work I did was just a part of the story that the Tara Pacific Expedition want to tell, and that I have for the future to correlate my result with the genomic transcriptomy. Also, the microbiome needs to be involved, and I need to go further for the environmental uh, analysis. Thank you for attention. Thanks, Ludovic, and congratulations. You were also in on time. Um, yep, let's open in questions. Uh, Aldine, Juliette, go with Aldine, always. <laughs> OK. So thank you, uh, Ludovic, for this uh, really nice presentation. Uh, it was really quite clear. So but how, how do you define a biomarker? Um, like biomarkers is um, a parameter, like in the uh, living organism that can give you an information. For instance, uh, we were interesting about the health of the corals. And for, in, for in our case, we used like the tissue thickness. And uh, tissue thickness, if you are more like thin, will mean that maybe you are in a stress because you don't have enough food. And yeah, okay. that was the idea behind the biomarkers analysis. Like you have a parameter and that can give you a story about how is the, the organism. Okay, and uh, which kind of biomarker can you imagine adding in your study to uh, complete and reinforce the data you, you go through? In fact, uh, uh, there was planning to have like the cellular stress biomarkers that look inside the cell of the organism to see if there is a stress. There is the ubiquitination and carbonylation of protein. So that look at the turnover and the damage of protein, as well as the oxidative stress defenses. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then, um, Juliette, you want to continue? Yes. Uh, first, thank you, Ludovic, for our presentation. Uh, I learned a lot and it was well explained. Um, my question regards also um, the type, different biomarkers that you are using. I suppose that when you are sampling the corals and measuring the protein, etc., you are going to stress them. So, do you know the limits of that stress, or it can influence uh, what you can find in your tissues? And so, like Aldine, I wanted to know what other biomarkers that you can use this. Uh, to, to make it more clear, to encompass these limits of uh, cellular stress? Yeah, so uh, for the effect of the possible manipulation of cores and including like bias, uh, there was some tests on the tower boat, in fact, like they were testing different condition of uh, preservation and looking at how the result could change. And all the sample were like instant freeze in nitrogen, mm -hmm. like to really preserve the structure, preserve the enzymatic activity uh, like they were. So they tried to avoid uh, as much to include uh, additional stress to the score. And yeah, as I answered to Aldin, the other biomarker will look at, into the cellular stresses, like looking at the protein damage, but also uh, the oxidative stress. We could also imagine to look at the apoptosis rate of the cell, as well as the, all the DNA damage due to oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. To really look in which state they were, like cellularly speaking. Can, can we um, can we continue to do that now? I mean, as there are still uh, tissues left uh, on the sample. You mean? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, some core samples were really thin, so it was really hard to get the amount of protein uh, necessary to do the uh, biomarker assay. Uh, however, yes, some core were quite thick, like uh, for instance, for Tesla Bata, which were really stable. But we speak about like core, so it's really like, however, they are thick, but they are really small. Okay. Juliette, or oh, Aldine, maybe I come back. 
So, uh, quick question. You, you mentioned that the guano may, may have an effect on, on, um, on the biology of, uh, of the coral, right? If I yeah. understood well. So, how can you measure that in the, the water? Can you measure a uh, change in a chemical parameter in the water on an island where there is much more guano than another, or just visually looking at the amount of guano on the island? Uh, in fact, the PCA that you, environmental parameter PCA that you are looking, were the parameter in the water. So it was the, you can look at the POC, so particulate organic carbon, which is size of particle really large. Mm -hmm. You can also look at the nitrogen, which yeah, can yeah. come from the uh, faces. Oh, that can okay. be really uh, the influential factor for the uh, symbiont division. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I miss it. Thank you. Um, maybe coming back on the POC uh, deposits. Um, so, anyway, so the, I guess um, we're talking about the POC in general, not only the, the guano, I guess. So, it's uh, something problematic with coral. So, I guess they like when there are waves. Yes. And, that's right. and, and so, do you have this uh, this variable also? that you can test in a, in a PC or something like the exposure or the exposition to the, to the, to the waves. Because uh, just a question is that I saw that for, for each of the islands, you have different sites, like here, for example. Okay, can you come back on yeah, here? Morea, Chesterfield, Clipperton. Um, we, we can see even on the satellite pictures, it give a guess that there are different uh, exposure to waves. Yeah. And uh... so did you test that? We were testing the site uh, independently to see if it was like significantly different, but we found no difference at all for all the three islands between the sites. Despite the different exposure, which was quite clear, like also for Clipperton, this part is a water, a, a soft water part, fresh water, and there it was escaping. And there were just the site here, but we didn't find like significant results or uh, the difference in terms of biomarkers. Okay, so if waves have no effect, it would it mean that uh, it means that POC is not a problem of deposition, but more in, in the water for the transparency of the water? POC could be also due to the current that was, uh, I think, not sure here, but was taken into consideration. Like uh, the current on Chester Hill could also be an hypothesis to explain why the bug was so high. Like, uh, oh, okay, but it's, it's more uh, sorry, it's more the problem it causes. Like, if it's because it's depositing on the corals, or it's simply because it's in the water column and so it's interfering with light. Okay, I see. So it's more about water turbidity. But the fact that we have found more animal biomass and symbiotic biomass on the island where the guano was present show maybe the opposite that is not like a problem, but something good for them. Well, can you say again? You found more. Like Chesophy and Clipperton were the two islands where the highest uh, biomass, like Chesophy, the highest animal biomass, and Clipperton, the highest symbiotic biomass. That was also the two islands where the guano deposits were ah, present. Okay. Okay. And it showed that through heterotrophy, like turbidity is not really a problem, it seems, for them, because they overall take more biomass compared to Moria, which okay. is lacking those guano deposits and pop concentration. Um, did you have the possibility to compare um, the, these three islands with other islands already? I know. I guess this, the other data are being um, also uh, We explored. did it. In fact, uh, I didn't show it on the on the presentation, but we have the comparison for the biomarkers with the fourteen islands already tested, and Chesapeake and, and Clipperton were really high, and okay, Moria and, was more in the average. Uh, Right. And and this comparison with the other islands, they confirm the pattern you're observing be between uh, the two species here? Yeah, yes. Overall stability for Porites lobata and more variation for, for Porcillopoa mondvina. 
So you, um, uh, I would like to really highlight the fact that uh, during your presentation, you took time and effort really to develop things step by step. And it's really nice. It means that I, I, for me, uh, some questions have been raised by what you were saying and it was answered immediately after. So really good for that. It just, I have a, a part at the end that maybe for me is if it's missing. It's uh, the, the implication of that. Of course, we all want to know if um, what's the best finally for corals being generalists or specialists. If there is a battle, generalist versus specialist, who will win uh, the climate change war? Okay. Uh, that's a tricky question because we're also dealing with two cars that have two different life strategy, let's say. One is slow with low reproduction, so for it is the better, and he is a specialist. So you mean he can cope with only one uh, Zoxanthellae species. So in the short to middle term, for it is the better is going to win, let's say. But if he reach a threshold where the water temperature is too high, he could not like adapt, he could not keep up. And because he's growing really slowly and also it don't reproduce um, a lot, it could be disappearing. On the other hand, we have Fossilopora manduna, which is more like fast growing, high reproduction and generalist. So it will suffer short to middle term, but because it's generalist, it can cope with different types of Zoxanthellae that maybe can go, uh, uh, can survive the threshold that for it is a attack will not. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ludovic. Uh, and then, Juliette, if you want to add anything else, that's fine. Okay, um, so I'm going to maybe uh, end the uh, screen sharing so Solin can do it. I'm sorry, I don't see uh, anything. I don't know if, yeah, okay. 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 So, hello, you hear me well? Yes, we hear you and we see your slides. You can go ahead. Okay, so, um, for my part, I will talk about um, my internship at IRCON Laboratory and try to answer how Nematostella vectensis is a suitable bioindicator to assess pollution. And to do that, I will follow this plan with giving you an introduction and contextualize uh, um, the work that I've done on state of art of uh, bioindicator of pollution by giving you um, uh, the context of the work that I've been assigned before COVID-19 to have a global view of uh, what I did to, uh, to list different type of bioindicator of pollution and give you some example and methods and then uh, question those methods uh, about the sustainability of them um, to give you another way of bioindicating, which are a transgenic bioindicator, by again giving you an example and method. And then I will sum up uh, with the Nematostella vectensis, telling the advantage and limits that uh, this sea anemone has, and then conclude. So Nematostella vectensis uh, is in a sea anemone that live in uh, estuarine water, at the border of salt water and fresh water where uh, human activities are present and uh, there's harmful substances that are discharged in quantities. So this sea anemone uh, is uh, usually uh, exposed to uh, several pollutants. But I will uh, introduce you a bit more about uh, this animal. This animal, this anemone is genetically close to human and very easy to culture in laboratory because of its size, because of the fact that there is no sign of aging or uh, disease that is, is very easy to maintain. And also because of its extreme regenerative capacities, uh, we were able to do several tests. And the fact that also uh, is, is a characteristic is that it's sexual and asexual reproduction. 
And so with this extreme regenerative capacity, the aim um, before COVID-19 happens was to assess the pollutants at a phenotypical, a phenotypical level, which has been done by Mathilde uh, by doing um, and assessing the uh, lethal concentration 50 of six pollutants on unamputed and amputed uh, nematostella vacancies to see the sensitivity of uh, both uh, amputed and unamputed nematostella vacancies. And my part uh, before COVID-19 was to, to give a genotypical aspect of that. It was to um, assess the effects of uh, those pollutants that uh, Mathilde uh, did uh, previously on specific genes that may be uh, involved in stress response to heavy metal and endocrine disruptors that we find in literature. But due to COVID-19, I was unable to go to the laboratory. So uh, my supervisor suggested me to do a state of art of uh, bioindicator of uh, water pollution uh, of heavy metal and endocrine disruptors particularly. Um, to have a global view of where we can put nematostella vectensis in those concepts. And so to do that, I start by identifying uh, the concept and principle and reviews and articles on bioindication. And then um, through these reviews, uh, find articles on specific topics on bioindication of heavy metals and endocrine disruptors. Uh, to go to through the methodology that is used for species uh, in bioindications to finally answer a question, is nematostella a suitable bioindicator of uh, water pollution? And those reviews and paper will usually come from Google Scholar, research.net and sciencedirect.com. So Pollution bioindicator, they maybe have two types, uh, accumulation bioindicator, uh, which are organisms that present no evident changes in their phenotype while accumulating harmful substances. Um, and response bioindicator uh, that present uh, phenotypical change, damage, and also genetically, obviously, when exposed to even a small quantity of harmful substances. So this one is, this organism usually are sensitive to pollutant and accumulation bioindicator are here to give a quantitative uh, aspect of it. So I want to give you some example of those uh, type of bioindicator by, uh, with uh, Mitilus galoprovincialis, which is a muscle uh, really used to monitor heavy metals uh, in the field. Uh, Daphnia magna for the response by indicator, uh, really used uh, in uh, pharmacology, for example, for the immobilization, immobilization test uh, that indicate a phenotypical damage uh, of a harmful substance. And uh, Danuvario, which is a zebra fish, uh, used as a transgenic line with fluorescent protein to directly um, attest the presence of a substance. So first, Mitilus galoprovincialis is a bivalve, a muscle, uh, that has filter feeding uh, behavior, which allows uh, to uh, accumulate uh, a lot of uh, uh, substances. Um, and it's quite used as a sentinel to assess contamination by metals uh, in marine and estuarine ecosystem. And so for those organisms, it is, it is important that it is sedentary organisms because then they will um, reflect accurately um, the contamination in their surrounding area to give a, an accurate uh, value. And so usually the methods for those uh, accumulation by indicators that they use 40 specimen for each site uh, and then the tissues of this animal are digested, usually with nitric acid, to finally quantify uh, uh, the, um, the heavy metal uh, present in their area in the field. And it's a very important that it's a quantitative uh, aspect. Then for the response by indicator, Daphnia magna, which is a crustacean, um, is the most 
uh, as uh, the most uh, uh, frequently used standardized test or the immobilization test to assess um, the chemicals and water quality by using its jumping like behavior. Um, because actually uh, uh, when it swims, it's kind of jump and you can assess directly if the substance you put it in a contact uh, has a, an effect directly in this behavior. It's very um, easy to maintain and has a short lifespan, so six to eight weeks, and it's only uh, used in fresh water, which can be uh, problematic when you want to assess uh, something marine, uh, but usually it's used for uh, pharmacology to test drugs. So, so to remediate to uh, this harmful way uh, to assess pollution, uh, because the actual methods used are either to ground up the tissues to extract information or kill them by um, in phenotypical or genetical aspect. Um, there are also transgenic animals that could rapidly show um, signs of contamination without having to kill them. To kill them. And so this is the case of uh, Danyorario, for example, which is the most used and well-known model in, in ecotoxicology and pharmacology. Um, it's a vertebrate, which kind of um, uh, question uh, ethical issues uh, for this kind of animal. And its lifespan, it's about two to three years, uh, which is quite short compared to Nematostella, for example. Um, it needs space also in laboratory, and due to that, it's cost effective. Um, but um, those ecological tests that are done on it uh, um, and the effect of drugs uh, and chemical and the fish survival, the growth and the reproduction can be assessed. And what is important is it is easy to generate modifying line uh, to assess pollution. And here it's an example of what can be done to modify uh, the genetic uh, aspect uh, by adding a fluorescent protein uh, in the living bioindicator uh, attached to the gene that correspond to uh, the specific response of uh, a contaminant previously made. And this genetic strategy is micro-injected then into the zebrafish the embryos. Once the zebrafish at sta is stable, and, and then we can assess and see the fluorescence or that indicate uh, the presence of the specific contaminant uh, uh, present in the environment. So to sum up a little bit, uh, Nematostella uh, victensis, um, uh, next to uh, those uh, other uh, bioindicator, um, at an ethical point of view, uh, Nematostella it's an it is an invertebrate species, which is a plus uh, compared to Danyorario, which is a vertebrate. Um, it leaves, uh, it can, actually assess fresh and salted water if we dilute uh, the, the salted water, concentrate the fresh water to actually assess uh, in a real environment, which is not the case for, for the other, for example. Um, the fact that uh, it has for now uh, a lifespan that is infinite is also valuable for, uh, for example, if we want to uh, sell it as a kit for a uh, pharmacology test, for example, because they can maintain it uh, in their uh, facilities. The fact also that is as uh, asexual reproduction uh, is also a positive aspect because while you have one, actually, if you have one genetically modified nematostella victensis, you can uh, cut them in part and have multiple ways and multiple numbers of nematostella victensis to do tests. Um, it's quite easy to maintain, as I said, because uh, you, it, it doesn't, it, it's not very needy in the laboratory. And it's regenerative, it's regenerative 
capacities are also allowing us to um, to assess uh, the effects of pollutants. But there are some limits to genet genetically modified nematostelavic tenses, of course. Uh, for example, the inability to assess pollution directly in the environment. Uh, we can't put it in the environment because it's genetically modified. And also the bias, the fact that it's raised in laboratories and not uh, actual uh, nematostella victims that are uh, in contact with uh, their environment. And so to conclude, nematostella victensis is actually a suitable bioindicator of pollution with uh, considerable advantages, uh, thanks to its regenerative capacity and sensitivity to uh, chemicals and endocrine disruptors. Its lifespan is also a considerable advantage for ecotoxicology or in pharmacology or cosmetology uh, to do tests. And the next step uh, through after that is that uh, the new intern, Frida Kosen, uh, will have could continue this project and assess actually the effect of pollution at the genetic, genetic level to finally um, uh, see if uh, the response on gene is possible and, and introduce uh, a fluorescent protein to, to make it the bioindicator of pollution fluorescent. And if I have time, I want to thank um, uh, IRCON Laboratory for hosting me before COVID and in Zoom meeting after. And I want to thank my supervisor, Eric Kottinger and Joao Calvado for their patient and pedagogy. And finally, I want to thank the entire red team for their hospitality. Thank you. Thank you, Soline. Um, yeah, I'm the timekeeper today. So yes, you were also uh, doing your presentation in the, a lot of time. Uh, Aileen, do you want to, uh, to start the questions? Um, yeah, so at the beginning, you start your first I, the first slide of your presentation, it's, uh, you raise a question about, uh, about nematostella. So now with all the knowledge you have uh, accumulated during this, this master training, so which kind of uh, approach um, are you thinking uh, to answer to this question? Um, by approach, uh, you mean uh, what kind of uh, indication it may give us? Yeah, uh, because you, you mentioned how nematocervic tensis is a suitable bioindicator to access pollution. Um, yeah, in my opinion, uh, it's quite uh, valuable for uh, tests. Uh, uh, or uh, heavy metal or endocrine disruptors in actual laboratories. Mm -hmm. uh, because for now, they're not, there is no, uh, there's a, a huge bias about, uh, uh, in my opinion, the fact that it can be in a natural marine environment or not marine, but uh, a sample coming from the field uh, mm -hmm. is not realistic for now. Yeah. So I think the way we want to assess is just to have to see if there is an actual effect on it. So okay. it's confident that we know where it's coming from. Okay. And in terms of strategy, so how how did you choose your your gen of interest? Uh, if you want to develop transgenic line with nematocella to access uh, some pollutant in lab condition, so how did you? target or to, uh, how did you choose your gen of interest to uh, light on or off with the pollutant? Uh, well, uh, this one as are, are the one that I've, uh, that actually Mathilde uh, and I uh, looked in uh, the literature. So in previous study to see uh, what kind of uh, gene nematostelavic tenses uh, are uh, assessed uh, with to see the response uh, of specific pollutant on them. So it still has to be verified. It's not the genes that will be used or, or for now at least. So, but this is the, the, the work that Frida will have the chance to do uh, in a few months. 
Okay, and then uh, you you are talking about ethics at the end, but you mentioned ethics uh, vertebrate versus invertebrate. Can you develop, please? Yes, because um, since uh, vertebrate uh, are uh, very cl um, has a, a nervous system and uh, can sense uh, uh, more the the harmfulness of uh, uh, any chemicals. Uh, it raises question about how harmful it can be to to them to assess pollutants because of their proximity to a uh, human way to, to feel. Well, it's not because nematostera do not have any uh, nervous system, so centralized nervous system that uh, yeah. there is uh, no sensitivity to, to yeah. pain or some other thing. So there is much more... Uh, um, if you want to address ethic regarding this point, I mean, it, there is much more study to to uh, to dig into to know that. But it's just that vertebrates they are under governmental law for animal experimentation, mm -hmm. not yet invertebrate, but uh, except cephalopoda. But for nematocela or any kind of other invertebrate, it's not because there is not yet governmental law that you don't have to think about ethics, okay? Yeah, of course. So this is a point that it's very yeah. important, okay? Yeah, of course, even for the transgenic line, we can uh, question the ethics. Yeah, no, I was uh, asking you, Aldin, if you wanted to go ahead or Juliette. Okay, Juliette. For me, I, I don't have any further questions. <laughs> okay. Um, I, um, don't don't uh, don't worry, Solin. I have. Wow. I thought you were still here. Um, can you come back to your slides, maybe 12? Um, I've got some questions about the literature that you're using to, to, to mention. Uh, to, to state this information here. For example, um, Mytilus, um, so you're saying that mostly the method used is to use 40 specimens for each site and so on. So is it something really largely uh, adopted, a consensus? So is it something that you read in multiple papers? Yeah, it's something that I read in multiple papers and I did a mean, it's between 30 and 50 actually, usually in, uh, in papers. And this corresponds to how many papers, or do you have some names? Uh, um, not really. An idea? I mean, okay. are we talking about two, three papers, or 10, 15, 20? Uh, no, it's more uh, four or five for this species, four or five uh, papers. Okay, and are we talking about uh, French methods? or internationals, uh, because I guess not other countries have the same assays? Uh, no, it's not only French, it's um, uh, Mediterranean. I see in, I saw in the Black Sea also use this uh, species and also uh, the border of Morocco uh, in um, Casablanca. So okay, are you talking about, because the lack of literature is a bit frustrating for me, are you talking here about research papers or uh, policy papers, like regulation from the French government? No, no, uh, research papers. Okay, and do you know how uh, on the state level, for example, uh, pollution is assessed? So, uh, I mean, uh, you know, to close the beach, to see the impact of, um, uh, of a harbor, of a sewage on, on, the, on the environment. Uh, I didn't quite, can you repeat the question? Because if you're talking about research papers, yeah. it may not be the same that uh, in that method used by um, the the government by the state to measure pollution. Okay, yeah. and I believe it's kind of organized nationally, also at the European level. So, do you know if it's the same method? Mm. Um, unfortunately, it's not something that I. Uh, looked at like at a policy level but yeah I should have okay um, and then you're speaking about Daphnia which is mostly uh, fresh water do you know if it can be used uh, anyway uh, with salty water maybe with diluted water 
Is it something used also? No. It's not no, it's not? No. No. Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't get the no. If it's no, it's not used, no, or no, you, yeah. you don't know? Uh, yeah, it's uh, no, it's not. It's only in fresh water. OK. And so it leads me to nematostella. Uh, what is the salinity of nematostella? Uh, you mean its environment? It's like yeah. one third salt water. So uh, when you're talking about pros and cons of nematostella, uh, what about this one? That it's not the salinity of the water. Yeah, it's not the salinity of the water, but what is interesting is that since it live in a uh, one third uh, salted water, we can still put it in a in um, a sample that is diluted from the actual field. For example, if it's salted, uh, and just add a concentration of salt when it's it's coming from fresh water. That's what what I was uh, trying to emphasize compared to other which are only fresh water. Yes, but if the purpose is to assess the pollutant concentration in seawater at some point, if you have to, do, to, to dilute it, so to use only one third of, of the concentration initial, will not be a, a problem also here to dilute the pollution. Yeah, it's also um, a, a problem, uh, but that I think that can be uh, extrapolated at the end. Yeah, because here's the, the, I, I, if I understand the idea is to find um, a species which is interesting in terms of uh, detecting low level of pollution. Yeah. Okay. And so what about zebrafish? Can we imagine doing that also with zebra, zebrafish? Uh, for a fresh and salted water? Yeah. Uh, no, it's only uh, used in fresh water. Okay. So um, here, if we want to analyze uh, seawater, do you have other uh, other species uh, of interest to compare nematostella with? Um, uh, in salted water? Yeah, uh, aside from Mytilus. Um, yeah. Um, I saw uh, some paper uh, for uh, Anemonia viridis also. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you can elaborate a bit. Um, no, not really. No, the others, I don't ask questions, so I keep going. Yeah, um, I choose those one uh, to, uh, because they were tra uh, transgenic uh, lines. That's why I choose to speak about those. I may finish just on something, uh, it's, it's not a big deal, but something I didn't get exactly. When you're talking about zebrafish, and you're saying it again here in this in this table, uh, you say in the, for zebrafish that it needs space in lab, so it's cost effective. So maybe there is a, some, an issue here with the cost effective for me. It means it's good, like it, it's not costly. Uh, no, I meant it was... Uh, uh... It has an effect on cost. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. You know, being effective, I think it's when you're good at something. <laughs> no, no. It means that you. It's it's more. It's costly. I guess it's more. It you need more money. Okay. Aldine, Juliette, do you want to add anything? You're good. Uh, Soline, some question if you want to. Uh... Uh, no, I'm I'm good. You're good? Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I know if the users are, are still here around. Um, yes. Uh, Ludovic, Alia, just to say um, say bye bye. And, and so, um, because good luck also for, for what's following. Enjoy your end of year. And yeah, take some long breath during the two weeks that comes. You need that. Thank you. Thank it was you. great to see you. Bye bye. Thank you very bye. much. Have a good day. Good day. Juliette and Aldin, we stay here. We uh, start the live. By the way, we're coming back at uh, uh, 1 30, no, uh, at 2 with uh, 